Hello, everybody. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of global macro here at Tasty Live. Welcome to the show. We have an interesting week with us this week. Um, it is a bit thin on macroeconomic data, which in a sense is kind of a good thing. Because what it does is it gives the markets an opportunity to find a path of least resistance. Uh, we've obviously had a lot of news to digest. We've had Fed policy announcements. We've had NFPs. We've had banks collapsing. There's been um, a whole lot of news flow here um, in March already. And here now we have a week where... There's a bit more at the end of um, the week with uh, some inflation data, some data out of China. But for most of the week this week, it's smooth sailing as far as um, big splash macroeconomic data that's scheduled for release. That, of course, doesn't mean that nothing is going to uh, come out of the woodwork uh, here that isn't scheduled, that isn't on, um, on the calendar. These things, of course, happen. Needless to say, nobody put SVB's failure on a calendar. But it looks like, from where we sit currently, that we might have a week of contemplation whereby the markets might be able to resolve the default for the current environment, where they are biased to go uh, in the environment as it stands currently. And with that in mind, we're going to look at a couple things here that follow on from uh, the bank-related consternation that we've had over the recent weeks and seem to suggest that we aren't anywhere like out of the woods, even as um, we got news today that um, SVB's assets have, in fact, been purchased and by a regional bank, another regional um, bank, uh, not one of the large behemoth systemically significant ones. So let's just look at a few things here, um, anchor ourselves in expectations, and then take a look at why the markets still seem to be very much concerned. So this is just uh, by way of catch up. We can see here that what we have over the course of February and March is a kind of about face back and forth on uh, the yield curve and Fed policy expectations. So you can see that we're a little bit higher currently. Um, we, of course, had that rate hike last week as expected. So you can see um, the older curves here, the ones in the dotted lines are based from a policy rate of uh, an effective policy rate of 4.6. So essentially in that uh, four and a half to 475 range, the current policy rate 4.88, the effective rate, that's in the range between 475 and five. You can see that we have a, a very similar top on rates as we did at the beginning of February. So we're basically looking for a top at five, just just about at five. Uh, the expectations were um, two months ago now almost that we were going to linger there perhaps until mid-year. That is not what we're looking at now. We're essentially say, uh, saying we're going to get to that five by around June, and from there, cuts will ensue. Uh, you can see, though, that the curve looked much more dramatic in the middle, in the period between what these curves are showing. And in the small dots there, you have the curve before the SVB uh, collapse. And that, of course, inspired by better than expected U.S. economic uh, data, a whole round of it, suggesting the economy is hotter than anticipated. And so the Fed might need to keep hiking for a more uh, substantial amount of time and hold rates higher for a more uh, substantial amount of time, such that you had a peak Fed funds rate that was about 50 basis points higher than we are currently. So we've shaved off about half a 
percent of where the rate cycle would would peak. Another way of thinking about it is we've shaved off basically two standard sized rate hikes. So if a standard sized rate hike is a 25 basis point move, we've shaved off two of those. We've also substantially changed when the easing would come. Uh, as of um, even just two weeks ago, we were still looking at rates north of 5% well into the first quarter of next year, whereas now we're looking meaningfully below that as we start to bake in cuts for the back half of this year. You can see what that looks like currently. So for the May meeting, there is no longer a rate hike expected. The likelihood of one is very meager. Um, we're basically looking at a 50-50 uh, 50 shot. Uh, and the, the likelihood is now 53%. So basically just on the line, a coin toss, as it were, uh, which of course, is a dramatic decline as relative um, to where we were even just at the beginning of this month. From there, we start to ramp up into a rate cuts direction. And so you can see that rates peak at 4.95. That's that implied rate column. And then come uh, July, we're already looking for um, the first cut. So, uh, you can see that come July, we're already starting to approach the um, likelihood of a cut, 72% uh, chance uh, of a cut already baked in. And so by the time we get to September, those cuts are mounting. Um, if we're at uh, a range of 475 to uh, 5 now, we are already out of that range by July. We're already in, in the sort of four and a half to four seven five range again. Um, come November, we're in the four and a quarter to four and a half range. So that's another full um, cut. Uh, so as we get into December, you can see um, in that number of hikes uh, cuts column, minus 2.35 basically tells you you've had two full rate cuts already baked in and 35% chance of a third, which you then see fully baked in by January. So significant easing in the cards here. And you can see why. So this right here um, is a chart we've looked at before, it's the 12-month outlook for Fed policy um, in the orange. So 12 months forward, uh, the rate implied in the Fed funds futures, uh, 12 months from any given day. Uh, you can see we're near the lows of the recent consternation. And you can see that we've arrived there with another upswing in that OFR financial stress index. Um, OFR is the Office of Financial Research. That's an agency of the U.S. government. So you can see here, critically, the level of consternation in markets is not receding. And this is really the, the important bit. We've had the situation at Credit Suisse it was, um, with some arm twisting, taken over by its biggest rival, UBS. SVB has collapsed, and as of, um, as of today, we have confirmation that its assets have been sold. So that seems to have been tied up. Uh, we have similar uh, resolutions on deck uh, elsewhere where we've already seen uh, consternation, where we've already seen crisis. Nevertheless, the market's measures of perceived risk have not receded back down. And that's really important here. So the market continues to see issues. They continue to see risk in this space. Perhaps most worryingly, you can see here that we have an inverse relationship developing between that 
risk gauge, that OFR um, stress index, and the two-year break-even. That's a measure of inflation expectations over a two-year window that's backed out of what is priced into the bond market. And you can see here that we've had a pullback in inflation expectations, which of course is helpful, all else being equal for the Fed's objective of getting inflation back to 2%. It's not quite there yet. We're at about 2.5%, as you can see here. But it's come at the cost of this increase in financial stress, which paints a worrying picture. Because it basically says that, that if the rate hike expectations and lack thereof that we've just um, looked at, if that's now the path of least resistance and that generally holds, then if financial stress were to ease, inflation would creep back up in the direction of 3% and start beckoning the Fed to rethink again. And the way now to get this situation with inflation more anchored would be ostensibly for more stress to occur. And you can see here that, again, neither one of these things seems to be receding. So on the one hand, it's telling you stress remains elevated. On the other hand, it tells you inflation hasn't gone all the way back down to where it needs to go as far as the Fed is concerned. And so a difficult situation and one that ostensibly presents negative outcomes on both sides, which then explains this. This is um, essentially like the VIX index for um, the bond market. So whereas the VIX index is... Um, an index of implied options volatilities for the S&P 500. This is implied options uh, volatilities, one month uh, options volatilities for an, a weighted average of treasury securities. Weighted average because, of course, this represents different maturities. Uh, and you can see here that this surge in implied volatility is the most dramatic thing we have seen on this index since late 2008, early 2009, since before the 09 bottoming of markets um, in mid-March of that year. And so what we're looking at is clearly a very significant level of volatility uh, concern in rates, which is telling you that the markets don't think this is over. And the markets are, in fact, having some issues reconciling this very dichotomy. That if stress comes off, inflation probably comes back up and the Fed has to hike. But if the conditions aren't there for the Fed to hike, what that means is that stress remains elevated. And so one way or another, the picture on rates looks volatile. Now... Why are we still concerned about these ongoing issues? Well, there's really two big charts after this one that would speak to this thing continuing and issues remaining, even after uh, SVB and Credit Suisse have ostensibly uh, been tied up here, making the case that while maybe those episodes of this story have run their course, the story itself very much continues. The first is the outflow of deposits from the banks. So, of course, the biggest issue that we had in both the situation with Credit Suisse and the situation with SVB had to do with deposit flight. It had to do with liquidity. And you can see here, in this case, we're not looking internationally, we're looking just within U.S. commercial banks, 
you can see deposits have been falling basically since the Fed rate hike cycle started. So the Fed begins raising rates um, in March, and you start to see money coming out of the banks and flowing into money market funds. That's because those money market funds actually pass through some of these rising rates and allow investors to earn that interest income, whereas the banks do not. The banks don't pass through those higher rates trying to protect their interest margins. And you can see here how that starts to bleed deposits out of banks and push those deposits elsewhere and create the kind of liquidity conditions that we're looking at, the kind of liquidity concerns that we're uh, witnessing here. And what this outlines uh, is that this is far from just an SVB, a signature bank, a First Republic uh, kind of thing. This is economy-wide. This represents an outflow of deposits from the U.S. commercial bank sector as a whole. So this is by no means an episodic issue. That, uh, incidentally, is something that we're going to hear a lot about in the next 48 hours as Michael Barr, the vice chair in charge of regulation and supervision at the Fed, is going to be on Capitol Hill testifying about all of these things. Uh, he begins tomorrow. He'll be back um, the day after, and this will follow a similar framework as the semi-annual testimony that Fed Chair Powell does on monetary policy, where first he'll go to one House of Congress um, and then uh, the next. So first the Senate, then the House of Representatives, and we'll get grilled by the relevant committees there. He's already re released the text of the prepared remarks, which of course will be followed by Q&A, and that's really where the, the meat of the market moving uh, potential here is going to be. But the substance of those questions should address this and how we're going to be dealing with this. The prepared remarks seem to suggest that SVB was a classic case of mismanagement, um, that regulators flagged for SVB that they were having these issues, and that it was then on bank management to address it, and they didn't, making it almost seem like th this was if not an isolated case, then certainly a case without necessarily generalized implications. That while there may be other cases like this, it isn't necessarily the norm. But looking at what's going on with the draining of deposits around the financial system, what you see is that this is probably very widespread, at least in terms of the root cause. Now, how each individual institution deals with this will, of course, vary. But here's another chart on that front that is quite sobering. Uh, and this data is only available um, up through uh, the middle of last year, even less. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. This, uh, this data is from the Fed. Uh, the yellow bars there, but what you're seeing gives you a sense of where we're going. So the yellow bars there represent unrealized losses on the available for sale securities being held by U.S. commercial banks. Now, this is where this gets hairy. You can see that those mounting losses follow the rise in the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. So in other words, as the Fed is raising rates, you are seeing losses on these portfolios mount. And of course, we know that rates keep going higher for quite some months yet. So with your mind's eye, just picture what's happening with the yellow bars. 
we of course have to wait for for, for that data to become available to draw them in here with hard numbers but as you see the relationship from let's call it june of 2021 through to april of um, 2022 evolve look then at the 10-year yield and see where that leads these yellow bars so what you're seeing is just as the money cushion to offset those yellow bars rising is declining that's the orange line that you see here the need for a cushion that's the yellow bars rising is increasing and looking at the 10-year treasury yield seems very much likely to have increased in that time by a significant amount which tells us roughly speaking that while we may not have svb to worry about there is likely to be a whole host of svbs and svb adjacent issues not with svb itself certainly not with credit suisse itself but with rising rates and with mounting losses on sensitive portfolios all uh, on a uh, on a growing scale and at a time when the deposit cushion is falling so the vulnerability here remains other banks like svb other market players perhaps even in the shadow banking system where you have lending from non-banks that's still very much a concern and what we're going to hope to hear then from mr barr is how regulators intend to address this because of course what we don't have is any sort of legislative action to say we are going to backstop all deposits there is no reason to worry about banks failing there is no need for a run so there's no reason for a mass exodus of deposits any more accelerated than it already is we don't need to aggravate the situation further in the absence of that what we have uh, is essentially a system where the systemically significant banks the really large ones those are backstopped so those don't have a real liquidity constraint it would seem or at least officials would like us to uh, go with that idea so let's let's take them at their word there for now so if we have a situation where those systemically significant banks are in fact backstopped it is then incumbent upon those banks to backstop everybody everybody else to recapitalize everybody else when they run into issues but of course from their perspective the incentive is not to do that quickly or preemptively it is to do that at the possible last second before one of these um, other regional players or some other um, institution before they fail whoever runs into an issue the incentive is to acquire their assets at the cheapest possible price and so any kind of bank-led rescue will almost invariably be something that's reactive not proactive and something that is late in the game which means that we probably have a lot more consternation around this entire story still to come as deposits drain out as losses mount and that mismatch gives us continued issues that the commercial banks are not in a hurry to address before they become a problem and of course where that leads us once again is this chart here this is the uh, dollar smile theory this this goes back um to steve and jen had tip to him for uh popularizing uh this framework 
And this is where all of this becomes actionable. This is where all of this becomes a trade. So you can see here the relationship between the U.S. dollar and U.S. economic conditions in relative terms. So when U.S. growth is either outpacing other big economies, the G7 economies, or significantly lagging them. So when you get all the way to the right, you can see the dollar does well. That's the right corner of the smile there. When you get all the way left, you see the dollar that does well. That's that corner of the smile there. What this captures is this idea that when the U.S. is doing well, there's more growth, so there's more inflation, so there are more rate hikes, so it becomes progressively more lucrative to hold U.S. dollars because of the yield income on that. Currencies are yield-bearing assets. And so essentially, the more that the U.S. is outpacing, the more inflation there is, the greater one can expect rates to go up. And so the more attractive the dollar becomes almost on a dividend yield type of logic. It just becomes more lucrative to hold. Because, of course, one person's borrowing cost is another's lending income. And if you're holding dollars, then and rates on dollars are rising, then, then, then you're earning more yield on that. On the left side, when the U.S. is severely underperforming, the upshot is that the rest of the world is probably doing relatively poorly as well, because what you have here is the... Uh, lagging of what is the world's largest economy, the biggest contributor to global growth, writ large. And in that scenario, markets are likely to be very defensive. They're likely to come out of riskier securities and to cash out their positions. But of course, which currency do they cash out into? Well, ostensibly the U.S. dollar, most likely, because it is the most liquid. It is the least uh, then troubled by absorbing large inflows, the least volatile in that kind of environment, and thereby a beneficiary of risk aversion. And so if you're going to have an environment here where you can't quite make heads or tails on what's going on and rates volatility is just higher, which is, of course, exactly what we see here, and if it's tough to make heads or tails on what's going on here, either we have more inflation and more rate hikes and so more market turmoil, or we have more bank issues and so more market turmoil, it starts to make sense that, you, that what you're doing is a kind of rapid oscillating between one corner of this smile and another and spending relatively little time in the middle which seems to, on the whole, bode well for the U.S. dollar. Very tellingly, looking at the Invesco Deutsche Bank bullish USD ETF here, this essentially is just um, a tracker of the U.S. Uh, dollar index. You can see here, we pulled back over recent months, this is a monthly chart here, um, to retest former resistance now turned support at 2719, and we've put in a very emphatic bullish engulfing candlestick there, suggesting that bearish momentum has run its course and a reversal higher may be nigh, which of course tells you if it were to materialize as it's currently constructed, that the longer term US dollar up move which you can look back to all the way in 2011 f for the bottom and 2014 for the start of the rise after a long period of consolidation, the next leg of which might be about to get underway. That essentially, the multi-year U.S. dollar up move may be about to launch its next phase. If, in fact, all of this sets up as it appears to. And that 
is macro money for today. Thank you very much for joining me. We are here Monday through Thursday every single week right after overtime with a friend of the show, Chris Vecchio, uh, head of Futures and Forex here at Tasty Live. Uh, I'm on with Chris as well on Fridays for Futures Power Hour, on with Tom and Tony for First Call Sunday evenings here in the U.S. Uh, and um, outside of those shows, uh, you can catch me on Twitter, opining at Ilya Spivak. Thank you very much for joining, everyone. See you tomorrow. Take care.